Meet the Farmer TV is made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified and Melly Productions, with additional support from Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture. Okay, Richard, so uh, I'm Mike Clark. I'm, I'm out here on the farm, but uh, you go ahead and, and tell us what it is you're doing here at this uh, summer camp fair. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Michael, for having me. I'm here at the Doubletree Hotel. Uh, they had a uh, summer camp fair where 60-some uh, companies come in and present or show videos on what they offer uh, parents to send their camps uh, or to send their kids uh, to summer camp. I represent the Stacey Bone Cooking School. Uh, we're out of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and my wife and I have been running this for some 11 years. And what we specialize in is teaching our students ages from 8 to 17, teaching them a palate. Uh, palates defined by, of course, is what you smell, uh, what, what a student spell, smells, and what they, what they taste. And uh, we've been, like I said, doing this for some 11 years. What we do is bring organic food in uh, from the local farmers. We have a lot of uh, just wonderful farmers around Chapel Hill. And, uh, and then we uh, play games with them. Uh, the typical day, you know, starts at, at 9 o'clock. They'll go out to uh, local artisans, local farmers. They might learn beekeeping. They might learn uh, cheese making. They, uh, they go into a chocolatier, learn chocolate, uh, you know, how to temper uh, chocolate, how to uh, infuse uh, flavors in the chocolate. Then, uh, you know, during that whole week, they'll be uh, doing demonstrations at, at restaurants and, and farmers and stuff like that. Uh, when they come back to the cooking school, they make a five to seven course meal every day, okay? And it's not just following a recipe. Uh, these are restaurant quality uh, uh, recipes that they're doing, but uh, food is half uh, science, half art. What I do, I have this big herb and, and spice garden. Uh, we try to, you know, uh, teach them, of course, what the difference between an herb and a spice is, but what's the difference between a dry herb and, and a fresh one, okay? Uh, a simple uh, game that we play with some of our students is with fresh eggs. Uh, when you buy a fresh egg, you make a frittata, and you blindfold some of the students, have them test uh, the store-bought eggs compared to the fresh eggs, and uh, you ask them which one is more flavorful. They're always going to pick the, the fresher eggs. Now, often you might say, which one do you like best? Now, that would vary. Most of them, of course, like the more flavorful one. But if, even if they don't like the more flavorful one, uh, we ask them to identify why. What herb and spices you don't like? Or what, you know, what don't you like about the fresher egg or stuff like that? So, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We believe that uh, uh, through flavor of the food, um, and that's what we teach, is just trying to identify the flavor, developing the palate, is nutrition comes hand in hand with, uh, with flavor. Uh, the old adage that, uh, you know, 20% of, of, uh, of, of, of the flavor of an apple is developed in the last two weeks hanging on a tree, uh, it also comes with more nutrition in those last 20 weeks. Uh, last two weeks. So, um, so we teach the flavor and nutrition is a, is a side effect of that, uh, of that uh, developing of a palate. Well that's really interesting. Tell me about the, the kids. Sometimes uh, you, you think a kid's palate is, is uh, like only bubble gum, uh, candy bars, and soda pop. Do, do they really have a, a deep appreciation for the d subtle differences between a dried herb and a fresh herb or uh, an old egg and a fresh egg or the, the organic it's produce a, or the farm fresh stuff you bring in? Do they, they really, uh, do they have a, a refined palate to tell those differences? Yes, and that's a good question. Is, is actually statistically, or scientifically I guess you would say, is the palate of a child is more sensitive and more defined than an adult. Uh, take uh, the sense of smell. Uh, an educated uh, sense of smell uh, for an eight-year-old, they can identify some 350 different smells. Okay? Where the average 35-year-old on a good day can do 250. Okay? The difference, of course, if you give a fig to an adult, 
is, uh, I mean, he's smelled a fig before. And so he can quickly identify it. When you give it to a 12-year-old, he might, he'll, I know what it is, I know what it is. But then when you tell him what it is, it's, oh, of course. But then a few days later, you have them smell it again, and they quickly pick, oh, that's a fig. Okay, so the palates, and that's, I mean, in France, we go six weeks in France also. Uh, we have uh, a school in the Loire, in Paris, and in, in uh, Provence. And um, the schools in, in France do that at, 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 you know, kindergarten, first grade, where some of the farmers would come in and develop the palate of the student. They don't talk nutrition, although that's part of it, is, here, taste this. Here's this mushroom, which, you know, this one's a couple weeks old. This is a, you know, fresh one. Which one do you like and why? Okay, and let them seek out their own palate and let them in there as they grow up seek out what foods they like. Well, that's really interesting. Now, are these kids all uh, have some sort of culinary interest? They think they might like to, to cook or they're, they have some food orientation? Or are they choosing you for that? Yeah, I mean, we, we get a, a variety of students. Um, and the Food Channel certainly helped uh, with, with that uh, through the years. Uh, many people, many young uh, of our students started out watching the Food Channel, so they had an interest. Uh, they cooked cookies with their grandmother or the mom, and they found that enjoyable, found that pleasant. Okay? So yes, as when they come to us, they do have an interest in food. Uh, they they want to learn techniques. We teach, of course, the knife skills, baking skills, and sautéing skills. That's the science side, but we also teach the flavor side. And then once again, that's, that's important. Once they're hooked on the flavor side, the rest of their life, they're going to be seeking out the fresher apple, the local farm foods. And uh, you know, they, don't, they won't mind spending a little bit more. They want that it's more satisfying. They don't eat as much of it. And they just feel good about themselves. Wow, that's really great. It, yesterday, uh, Frank and I were at a meeting of uh, about 70 vendors from uh, the Charlottesville Farmers Market that's going to start up in a couple of months and uh, sort of a planning meeting and right afterwards we ran into a, a 13 year old boy who was so excited about food and he had decided he was already going to culinary school and he'd taken a little tour uh, uh, at the uh, Charlottesville Technical Center they had a culinary day where they brought some of the kids through and he said he already knew the three types of onions mm -hmm. of, of diced yeah, and, and steamed and caramelized they're, they're and, definitely and he was so excited that he already knew what was going on and was just sure he was going to be a yeah. chef. So is, is this the age level that you're dealing with? What, what sort of ages are well, you, do you like have? Said, our, our day camp goes from 8 to 14. Our residential camp goes from 11 to 17. Uh, if you go to our European uh, culinary camps, you have to be 12. So there is a certain uh, maturity you, you, know, you should have. Uh, you know, to the camps. But I tell you, one of the wonderful part about what we do for a living is in, in Chapel Hill, we have a wonderful farmer's market and, uh, and we go there every week. And when you see one of our students who are like seven or eight and they're bringing their parents to the farmer's market to pick out fruits and vegetables, okay? And saying, oh, we're gonna cook this tonight. And they'll, you know, they'll introduce their parents to us. And it's, it's, it's kind of the, the reverse side of things, but that's, I, we see more of that going on that um, our students are actually teaching their parents now. Wow, that's great. We, we've seen uh, 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 a couple of parents that come uh, to the, the Charlottesville market and they uh, purchase baby sorrel leaves from mm -hmm. us and they put them out like hors d'oeuvres for the kids and they watch TV and munch on uh, fresh sorrel leaves. Yep. I guess it's kind of a pungent... Uh, uh, astringent lemony flavor and and uh, it's the kids just love it and uh, they, they think they're eating candy yep it's it's and that's the right time uh, the earlier you uh, uh, expose uh, you know students you know we, we have people who want to come to our camps who are five or four and uh, of course uh, we have to tell them to wait a little bit but get them the excitement make it fun I mean the kitchen should be fun uh, I think uh, a lot of people feel that the kitchen is, is now become a chore, okay? But it, it doesn't have to be. Uh, the technical side of it is, is quickly, you know, you can learn. And once again, the, the both physically and emotional side of, of cooking your own food, uh, especially local food and the flavors you get it, uh, the benefits are, I mean, physical, mental, 
uh, relaxation, digestion, I mean, so many benefits to, uh, you know, uh, cooking local food is just... Is, is well, that's really terrific. It, it sounds like it'd be a, a wonderful opportunity for us to uh, follow you with a camera through the market, picking up some stuff, and, and then back into the kitchen. And, and do you have classroom for the, the technical side? Absolutely. Um, we built our own cooking school, actually. Uh, on our, we have five acres. And uh, uh, my wife is, like I said, is, is uh, French. So it's one of those things that big gardens and uh, cooking is in, in the blood. And uh, once again, is what we try to do is expose uh, as many students, uh, we work with the high school, to, uh, to the flavors of, of the local food. And so we do have a, a, a dedicated cooking school that we built right on our property. Well, that's great. Do you, do you have a website or a place people could go and maybe see some information yep. and, and pictures about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. It's uh, www.cecibon.net. That's C-E-S-T-S-I-B-O-N dot N-E-T. Terrific. Well, that's great, Rich. It's been great talking to you, and I can't wait for us to get out and, and see the kids at the market and picking fresh herbs from the herb garden and, and there in the kitchen. Uh, and end the classroom learning new material. Okay. Well, thank you, Michael. Is, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to uh, say while we have the cameras rolling or anything we didn't cover? Nope. I, I've been talking to Frank here uh, for a good half an hour. What you guys are doing uh, we, is awesome. It is, uh, in, in, in this country, uh, educating the, the youth on uh, the local farmers and, and food is just fantastic. Power to you. Well, that's terrific. Well, hopefully we can put together a little uh, video segment of, of this conversation. Maybe you can use it on the web and, and uh, we can travel down to see you and, and get some of the, the students and the kids and, and get a full show okay. out of it. We look forward to it. All right. Okay, terrific. Thank you much. Thank you and have a safe trip okay. back. Here we are in the mayor's office in City Hall in Charlottesville, Virginia. We're going to talk today to the Assistant Director of Economic Development, Chris Engel, about the new program, Shop Charlottesville, to reward people with special discounts and special deals by shopping in Charlottesville and, and not shopping online or, or going outside of the area to get things that are freely available in Charlottesville. Give me some, some background so we uh, kind of know what's going on. I guess you guys are interested um, in Shop Charlottesville because of its similarities. I mean, there are certainly some similarities in, uh -huh. in what you're trying to do with, with local food and produce and what we're trying to do, which is really focused on uh, local business, particularly retail. Okay. So the concept, I think, of uh, buy local um, with the produce is very similar to what we're trying to, trying to push here, which is to encourage folks uh, to understand the benefits of shopping locally uh, for the retail goods versus... Uh, traveling out of, out of state or out of the area mm -hmm. or um, online, which is the real, the real killer in yeah. terms of um, dollars leaving the community to an online merchant, which... Um, so a lot of people aren't bothering to walk downtown. They're just typing into their search engine and coming up with... We, sus we suspect so. It's really tough to tell that what the numbers are, but uh, with the advent of the Internet and all the online merchants... Um, we're pretty confident that uh, local merchants are losing business to, to, to online sales for sure. Um, so this effort is really just to, um, to educate folks and, and get folks to understand the benefits of um, purchasing a toy locally, or purchasing a book locally versus um, an online purchase or an out-of-area out of purchase. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the notion is that a lot of people don't make, connect all the dots. And the reason that the city is involved is because 1% one, 1 of every uh, purchase, taxable sale, um, comes back to the city general fund and helps fund important services, police, fire, uh, parks. And this all. is the local, local portion of the sales tax? That's right. 1% of every, of every sales comes back to the city. Um, the other 4% goes to the state. Um, so we're directly impacted as a local government uh, by the sales that are local businesses uh, actually produce. And that 1% accounts for um, just over $10 million in this year's uh, city budget, and that's uh, roughly 8% of the total city budget. So it's, mm. it's a significant number of importance, 
Um, and as that number um, decreases, we, we get concerned. So uh, uh -huh. in, in late November, um, some merchants, local uh, merchants, contacted us and said, you know, we're concerned with the situation, the economic situation. Um, you know, is there a possibility for some type of partnership here in which the city has a vested interest, i.e. in your budget, your, the 1% that you get. Mm -hmm. We have a vested interest because it's our business and um, if we lose sales, we're going to suffer. Um, and the community has, has a vested interest in that, uh, you know, retail businesses provide jobs and, and, and jobs are important to, to, to everyone that lives in the area. And the more people with jobs and good jobs, uh, the, the better off we'll all be. So um, there was definitely a, uh, an idea that it made sense for both of us to, to be interested and to, to collaborate on, on a campaign that would uh, hopefully over time uh, convince folks to, uh, to shop more locally. Mm -hmm. And it, even if folks just dedicate a portion of the current sales that they're traveling to Washington or Roanoke or Richmond for or going online for, just a portion of those, redirect those uh, to a local merchant, um, we think we'll see a big benefit. Uh, so this effort, uh, convincing folks, thanking folks, appreciating folks that shop locally, and we know there are many that already do, uh, but trying to, to educate the rest um, on, on why it's important. And it's important you know, for a number of reasons. Uh, jobs, uh, you know, when you support a local business, you, they, they are hiring local folks. Uh -huh. uh, for, for the most part, we don't have people commuting in here from from far far afield to to, to work here. So um, you're, you're supporting local economy. At this point, um, you know we're about two months into this, and uh, we've we've had a group of uh, interested merchants come together several times to, to get this going. Um, it, it's so early that we haven't broadened the scope to, uh -huh. to include that larger larger group. Certainly, we could, and um, there would be you know a, a greater benefit in doing that, um, and perhaps that'll be a next step once we get, mm -hmm. uh, get the effort really kicked off here. Uh, we're very early in it. Uh, we've gone as far to get, get the buttons uh, uh -huh. cr created and a logo created, and uh, we're hoping to kick it off with um, some type of event here uh, at one of the, the local um, business shopping centers or, or districts, and uh, you know, have a media push that will, will hopefully uh, get the word out to folks to show up and we'll have some, some kind of good reason for them to show up to be part mm -hmm. of a raffle or right. prize drawing or something of that nature and um, you know start to start to get it going there uh, one of the other things that we're doing is is we're going to create uh, shopping bags uh, re recyclable shopping bags uh, with the logo on them mm -hmm. and um, probably a link to a website for more information and with the idea that uh, Perhaps we can encourage local retailers to uh, recognize folks that bring the bag in, some type of discount or special uh, that, uh, that could carry on over a period of months or, or, or even a year. Right. Uh, you know, every Thursday you bring the bag in, um, you get some type of discount. And that would be completely up to the local retailers how they handle that, but uh, would be a good way to, to encourage folks to use the bag, which is in and of itself uh, an environmentally friendly thing and, and something the city is certainly looking to looking to push uh, but it would also you know say to folks I can't take this bag to Washington and get that discount mm -hmm. you know I can only go here so uh, it would also fulfill that goal too so so if I'm a Charlottesville merchant how do I get involved do I, do I call you up or do I get absolutely a or get a bag or <laughs> uh, we will become more evident here soon as we uh, get this website launched uh -huh. we're in the process of creating a website that will actually have all the retailers in the city listed on there, name, address, phone number, and uh, it will be a, a, a site that folks who are searching for particular products can go and say, this is what I'm looking for, can I find it in Charlottesville? And mm -hmm. the site will help, help direct them to a, a local merchant that, that has that type of product. So once that's up and running, there'll be a, a portal on the website that will uh, be for, for local merchants to, to say, I want to get involved, I want some buttons or bags or, okay. or things like that. Um, so that will become available, um, you know, in another month we'll probably be in a position where, where that'll be possible. Oh. Now the, the Charlottesville City Market starts up in April, it April does. 4th. It does. Uh, I mean, that's a, a big shopping event on uh, Saturday. 
Uh, I know we just uh, we talked to the market manager, and they were like 1.1 million yeah. uh, last year, even before they'd completed the year. Right. They've had a really good year, and, and every year they've they've seen increases that have been phenomenal. And we are uh, that's on our radar as as a way to help kick this off as well. We we know that the folks that shop at the, at the Charlottesville Market City Market are already cognizant of the fact that spending their money locally is an yeah. important thing to do. So, uh, and that has a really a higher rate of return because there's, there's also, in addition to the 1%, there's a, a 6% uh, market tax. Yeah. It's just to support the, that market operation. That's so, correct. So that really mm -hmm. isn't draining any of the budget when, the, when that market takes off. It, it brings even more in to, to right. self-support. Well, there's an interesting trend um, nationwide, and I don't think it's affecting us here in Charlottesville, but uh, nationwide, there's there's somewhat of a reverse of that outsourcing, you know, called insourcing, uh -huh. where some companies are actually coming back uh, due to transportation costs and the value of the dollar uh -huh. um, declining. It's it's more cost effective for them to actually produce something here than it is in China or somewhere yeah. else, and then to ship it with shipping costs. So, since there are no big companies coming in for to to make more widgets that all the new widgets are going to be done on kitchen tables and by little small businesses and uh, a craft business or some of the things like we saw at the uh, Charlottesville Christmas market where yeah. one lady's making mustard and she has another craftsman make a wooden cutting board to go with it and they have a package of these things. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wonder if that's not true in cities all around the United States that the, the new businesses are going to come kind of from the grassroots, not from a big corporation coming in and doing something, but from individual families going, we lost our job or we're, we're not making enough money, we need to do something. Kind of a return to our, our, our ancestral roots as, as uh, pioneers and settlers where, mm -hmm. you know, you have a blacksmith and a cartwright and somebody knows how to do something and they do it and share it with the community. I think there's definitely uh, great potential and opportunity for those type of entrepreneurial efforts. And, and uh, particularly as we come out of this recession, I think that may be one of the things that, that helps pull us out is, is, is folks that uh, you know, have skills from a variety of places, have lost their job, or have just decided to move on and uh, start a small company, maybe mm -hmm. in their house, in their garage, and, and grow from, from there. Um, one of the new trends in economic development is, is uh, grow your own grow your own companies, um, you know, similar to the farming analogy of plant a seed and watch it grow. Well, uh -huh. Plant the seed of entrepreneurialism in somebody and um, they grow an idea and it becomes a company and uh -huh. it starts to make widgets and make more widgets. And uh, generally when you grow something from, from scratch like that, they're more apt to stay in your community as opposed uh -huh. to a big corporation that may come or go. Yeah. So that's, that's a concept uh, very similar to the farming analogy that, that, that work, is at work now in economic development throughout the country. And there's certainly great opportunity for that in Charlottesville. Uh, there's, there's an entrepreneurial spirit here already, uh, coupled with the fact that the university uh, is here generating technologies and new ideas. Uh, we see that as, as a, a key opportunity for yeah. us in the future. Now they had an incubator or something going on at Harris Street at one time, I think. Is, is uh, any of that still happening where they're trying to the, uh, I don't know if the, the SBA funding has changed a lot in the last four years where they're not really has. putting money out like they used to. It, it's changed dramatically. Um, there, there was an incubator effort um, several years, many years ago, I think as many as 10 years ago now, um, that I believe the university was involved in and perhaps the city and some others. Um, that went by the wayside for a variety of reasons. Uh, we are actually involved now in, in a, starting a technology incubator um, here in town mm. and the city is is supporting that um, because technology jobs are are have great potential here uh, for, for the reasons that I mentioned um, mm -hmm. primarily that the university is is close by and producing technologies um, that, that some of which will become you know viable products uh, and technology jobs frankly pay at wages much higher than the average wage locally. So mm -hmm. certainly a component of our growth strategy is, is to um, find and encourage technology companies to, to grow and stay here. And we think that incubator that uh, is, is very similar to, to, to the Shop Charlottesville campaign and that it's very new and it's kind of 
coming up to speed here as we okay. speak. So uh, later this year, we'll hope to have official announcement on that and, and get that open. Wow. So that's, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Anything else that, that we missed or? These are my seven reasons to shop Charlottesville. I just oh, good. Yeah. Well, let's, let's go over those seven reasons. You want to go over these? Yeah. All right. So this, the top seven reasons to shop in Charlottesville. It keeps your dollars in our economy. The dollars you spend in Charlottesville also help support Charlottesville businesses that in turn, in turn employ people who spend their wages in the community. This is the ripple effect that we talked uh -huh. about. And uh, that's first and foremost. Yeah. Um, number two, it creates local jobs. Um, local businesses create jobs for our neighbors. A variety of job opportunities are certainly important to a healthy, healthy community and economy. Number three, it helps the environment. Uh, buying locally conserves energy in terms of travel costs and uh, even packaging. And products typically you know are safe and well made because uh, local folks are representing them. Mm -hmm. uh, number four, it helps fund local government. Um, I mentioned the 1% that the city government receives from every taxable sale. Uh, that, that adds up to over $10 million and 8% of our budget. So that's significant. Um, when you spend your money in Charlottesville instead of online, that ensures that those dollars are reinvested locally in your community where your kids go to school and uh, when you pick up the phone to call the fire department, those folks right. answer. Uh, yeah, a lot of times those online purchases have no tax that's right. associated. That's right. You're absolutely right. Um, and that's not a good thing from our perspective. Uh, number five, it supports local nonprofits. Um, when, when nonprofits are doing fundraising campaigns, they knock on local business doors to, uh -huh. to, to finance those. So, um, if our local businesses are doing poorly, they're then in turn probably not going to yeah. donate as much to our local charities, which will, in the long run, hurt the, hurt the community. So uh, we, we believe it's important from that perspective. It also invests in entrepreneurship. Um, creativity and entrepreneurship are, have always been key and cornerstone to the American economy. And uh, we think that nurturing local businesses is, will help create and, and maintain a uh, healthy local economy. And finally, it makes us a destination. With the, the more interesting and unique our community is, the more tourists will want to come here for shopping mm -hmm. and other activities. And it just keeps us vibrant and healthy and, and alive. So those are the seven reasons to shop Charlottesville. Well, that's great. Well, thank you, Chris. We appreciate you, you explaining the, the new program to us. And, and we're excited about uh, partaking in Shop Charlottesville. Great. Well, I'm pleased to be here and look forward to seeing the show. Great. All thank right. you. Thank you. So now we've heard from Chris Engel, the Assistant Director of Economic Development for Charlottesville, about efforts that they're making to encourage people to buy locally, to buy within Charlottesville, and keep those dollars circulating for the ripple effect and the benefit in our community. So I hope you know now more about the local situation in Charlottesville, Virginia, and how community food systems can help nurture all of us and help our economic situation. For additional information and extended versions of this program, visit our website, www.meetthefarmer.com. Meet the Farmer TV was made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified and Melly Productions, with additional support from Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture.